Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar around SCADA or operational control. Um, now, what we're going to be doing today is going into a brief overview about um, why Wonderware are the leading suppliers of, of, of our types of software. Um, we're going to go into some of the fundamentals around why you would need a SCADA solution and how Wonderware can help with those types of solutions and also finish off with a little bit about the maturity models about how you take these things through the different layers and the different stacks in a organization. Um, so to begin with, um, as I mentioned, they are the world's leading supplier of HMI supervisory and control solutions. And there's a whole load of figures that back this up. Um, so they have lots of sites deployed globally and they are monitoring billions of industrial parameters. There's an unbelievable amount of transactions happening today and they store a, a huge amount of data. And there's a whole host of stuff around how we actually present that data, which is really important. But what does this mean? So yes, I know it's a lot of nice figures that um, appear here. There's, there's lots of things to, to back this up. But actually really what we're referring to here is this is a very long standing and very well known brand. So it's a, it's a company that's been around for 30 years, 30 plus years. They um, are leaders in what they do and their control market, their SCADA and HMI was um, the first Windows uh, based solution and they've been developing it ever since. There's also a huge ecosystem, and the ecosystem is key to ensuring success. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a key element to enable us to engineer, develop, and deploy the solutions into the right factories in the right scenarios. And you can be safe in the knowledge that there's investment protection there. There's investment protection through the engineering standards because you, different systems integrators can pick up the solutions and, and start to use them. Um, but you can also migrate from the very, very early versions up to the very late ones, um, as you see fit. Um, now, if we just have a, a quick look at the organizational maturity, um, and I've put a few different types of solutions into this stack. If, so if we go across and we look at HMI SCADA and what is now defined as operations management interface um, as, a, as a type of product, uh, you can see we start at the very bottom in reactive. Um, so when we look at the reactive part of the maturity organizational model, um, this is typically customers who are starting on their journey and they will introduce some type of visualization. And I've put edge control in there because it's very topical at the moment, but these are essentially just HMIs. So it's, uh, they could be incorporated in the machines, supplied by OEMs, but there's no real supervisory view at this stage or automated shop floor data collection. All customers have to start somewhere and it's usually um, that's the place to do so. So if we haven't done then, then there's where we'd, we'd make that start. And there's lots of productivity improvements and opportunities that we can get from that, including things like data visibility, um, reduced paper clutter, uh, remote accessibility to data. Um, so you can get some very quick wins by introducing something at this very low end of machine level. If we then move up the stack a little bit um, and we go over to things like SCADA, operational control, um, we start to move up the organizational maturity and this tends to be customers who have defined processes, um, but they can still um, characterize these as islands of automation. So it tends to be the people that may not have a central control room uh, it's not until you get to that consistent um, part of the maturity where they will then have that, that control room layer. Um, uh, and, and typically, if you uh, have got past that reactive stage, um, then they could be a, a customer that have actually stalled in that journey. So yes, they've introduced some visualization, some SCADA, some, some very um, general control, but they've actually stalled at that point. But if you do start to move up into that consistent phase, and there's even more opportunities that can be gained here, um, standardization, things like change propagation, um, which I'm going to come on to shortly, uh, improved operator efficiency, uh, greater process rela uh, relational context, um, and improved alarm management. And these are all key elements to um, becoming more efficient, more effective. 
Um, and we're not going to talk about the adaptive stage um, throughout this uh, presentation because we're, we're physically focusing on the, the control element, the SCADA pieces. Um, but these are really people at the forefront of investment in people, in technology, in infrastructure. Um, they use advanced manufacturing software in many areas, and they tend to integrate into enterprise systems like ERP. And it's possible for us to do that with Wonderwear. Um, it's just not the focus of today's webinar. The focus is really that control element at the bottom. Uh, and clearly, when you get to that adaptive um, maturity, there's lots more opportunities that can be had there in terms of productivity. So it's things like um, comprehensive business integration, as I mentioned, that enterprise layer, real-time resource um, allocation and planning, uh, global data-driven operations. We start to, to branch out much further than, than, than what, we, um, what we can do here. So this is really where the focus is, this operational control and SCAR development. So what are the fundamentals if we start to look at a few different pieces. So there's certainly standards that exist inside of there. Um, there's standards in terms of global standards that people adhere to, which I'll, I'll touch on. Um, there's also company standards. There's an awful lot to do with data handling. There's many different ways to skin the cat here. Um, in terms of data handling as well, we may look at alarm management. This could be alarm management for real time. It could be historical. It could be a, um, alarm analysis. And a big part of um, operational control is centralization. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that topic a bit more later on. Um, but if we first just have a look at standards and looking into industry standards, there's lots of them out there. But here's some of the key ones for control. So, um, ISA 18.2 is our alarming standards, our EENUA -E or EMUA 191 um, uh, uh, standard. Uh, ISA 88 is batch and control. Um, 99 is, is all security related, so we're talking about 62443. Um, 101 is HMI interfaces, so it's how we physically design those interfaces. And then 106 is continuous processes. From a company, um, really what we are looking at is things like design authority. Um, uh, and design authority, I'm talking about that as a collective term. So it's whether you have a section in your organization that can adhere to design and um, take the industry standards and ensure that these are followed throughout the development and the engineering of that SCADA solution, obviously in line with whoever the, whoever the integrator is. Um, and the reason we talk about design authorities is because there's a lot of key needs throughout a plant. Um, there's a lot of things that we'd like to have, it'd be nice to have inside of there. And without the design authority, it's very, very difficult to make sure that these types of things are replicated yeah. on a line by line, plant by plant, or even enterprise like site by site basis. But a design authority can actually help to, to achieve that. Um, I typically mention the security industry um, at the beginning there, the 62443, and really this is around the maturity model, working out where you are, um, and there's a, there's a maturity model there on the right-hand side, um, working out where you are in that maturity model and then ticking some extra things off the list to, to ensure you become more secure. And then we do have lots of webinars associated and dedicated purely to this topic. Um, but as you can see, if you... Um, have not done some of the elements of this maturity model at the beginning. So just securing, this is physical security, um, device hardening, the very simple things that you can get very quick wins on. Um, if you haven't done any of these at this lower level, there's no point in moving all the way up to things like um, threat intelligence at that top end and the anticipate level. You have to have the infrastructure at the bottom layer in this to be able to get the most out of it and then move up that stack and make your systems more secure. Um, but there's things inside of the software that can, can help um, in terms of security as well. And we'll come on to that too. Um, so we move on to, um, from a standards perspective, how Wonderware can help. So if we take commonality, and there's commonality in a few things. So there's situational awareness, which you'll have heard us talk about for quite some time now. So situational awareness is just a design concept. Um, I'm not saying you can't do this in other SCADA packages. 
because you can design and, and make things look and feel how you'd like them to look and feel. The difference here is that these types of graphics that you see on the screen there are provided out of the box. Um, so it allows you to create the same commonality, the same standards, perhaps it's part of your design authority, um, and are able to replicate that throughout your entire facility, throughout your entire enterprise. Um, it makes it um, our operators more efficient. It means that there's less training to do because they're more intuitive and you only have to teach people once on one SCADA system and they can move um, move amongst them because they'd understand them. Um, so there's lots of benefits. We've been able to, to have some commonality and some common design um, and wonder what help us to do that through the, the, the things that you can provide out of the box. There's also um, things like style libraries, global style libraries inside of the software. Um, so this allows us to divine, define global um, elements, global attributes, associate them with colors, how exactly we'd like them to look and feel. Perhaps it's formatting in terms of how many decimal places we need on, uh, on our values that appear on screen. It can be really important things. And if we have a design authority that has to adhere to these, it's very easy then from a global perspective here to just make the changes centrally and then it'll replicate through your entire enterprise. And you can take those configuration settings and copy them amongst applications. And if we go a bit deeper into the asset design and look at design authority, they may also look at a device level. So they may look at all the elements that exist as part of specific devices. And they understand and they know exactly how they want it to look and feel, exactly what types of PLCs they're communicating to, so they understand their inputs and outputs, um, perhaps what face plates are associated with it. They, they want them all sort of the same. Um, they need to define the same alarms and events. Um, the security they have to adhere to, so there's um, who has access to them, who can um, acknowledge alarms on them, et cetera, et cetera. And there could be lots of complex scripting associated with them, and also whether we want to store that data. Um, from a design authority perspective, you can um, configure these libraries of automation, if you like, inside of the software. So when you create it once, you can take it again and you can replicate it across different sites, different enterprises. Um, and it can go up to quite a large scale. So yes, here on the left, you can see quite a small asset, um, but on the right hand side, we could be moving up into full machine types. Um, and from a replication perspective, especially when you're looking at the, the likes of things like OEMs, um, this can be invaluable. Um, also on your site, if you do have uh, uh, the same uh, types of hardware, the same um, devices and assets that are coming into the the, um, the, into the factory, and again, it's very easy to, to replicate and make more of them when you've got this design authority and this, uh, these standards in place. Um, if we then move on to a bit about data handling, uh, I'm just going to start with um, real-time data handling to begin with, because I suppose when we assume data handling, we always think historical. Um, one of the things that we have to think about is connectivity. Um, so it's about having the tools and the capabilities. And as I'm sure you're fully aware from a Wonderware perspective, we can connect to any device, um, any um, small sensor that exists out there. They could be disparate assets. Um, in this case, I've put an example of a weather API that we can pull information into our solution and display the current weather forecast um, based on API data through one of the drivers that exists as part of the Wonderware um, product set. These are all things that, that you can um, you can just download, install, and configure yourselves. You look at the current process, and again, there's lots of situational awareness that exists as part of this. You can see um, the, the current process is key to understanding, especially from an operator perspective, exactly what's happening on the plant floor at any particular time. Um, and it's about having the right um, tools, the right visual representation to be able to and react to adverse situations as quickly as possible um, and ensure that the plant is running as efficiently as possible. Um, and we hear KPIs, key performance indicators, mentioned an awful lot. Um, there's lots of different ways, again, we can produce that from a, a real-time and a historical perspective. Um, huge, um, uh, big screen displays on the factory. And these, um, uh, are getting easier and easier with all the web-based tools that are becoming available from the Wonderware product set. 
If we then move on to historical data, and we'll uh, firstly have a look at things like snippets of information. I call it snippets because they provided some nice um, animations, some nice tools that exist inside of the graphics. Um, so again, it's not complex to get information back. We just say we want to see a trend of the last five minutes worth of data. Uh, and it will show you a very simple trend displays of exactly what's happened on that, in this case, a generator over a, over a short period of time. We know, don't have to switch to a big trend display, although obviously we can do for a more granular look at the information, as you can see here. Um, but we now have the capability to see that snapshot of information of the last few minutes with the data right alongside that real-time information. And it's a key to understanding exactly what's going on in the process again so that the, the operator can make the right informed decision as quickly as possible. And then there's a bit here around accessibility. Um, so again, because technology is moving on, wonder where I keep up to date the latest technologies, and um, we can now branch out into um, some of the latest web, web designs. We've got applications that move straight down to mobile devices so that we can get access to that historical data wherever we are in the world um, and also get notifications if something is um, just kind of moving slightly out of kilter uh, and we need to quickly address that. If we then move on to alarm management, and again, another key topic here. So if we move into the standards, and I briefly mentioned the um, ISA 18.2 or renewal 191 um, guidelines that uh, exist out there. Uh, and this came from the oil and gas in industry, and um, it, it basically states that one operator can deal with one alarm every 10 minutes. And anything more than that, and an operator is going to start to become stressed, um, isn't going to be able to make informed decisions on what's happening on the process. And the longer you leave an alarm, the worse it gets. So if this alarm comes in at a low priority, if it's left for a period of time, it will then become a medium priority. And this is how the alarm management and standard here um, shows you how to um, define that process. And from a Wonderware perspective, they enable, again, global parameters that allow you to choose um, the types of colors and images you want to replicate throughout your entire um, style library so that you can make a change centrally and then you can propagate that through based on the four criticalities that you see there um, in line with that, um, those guidelines and that, that standard. From a real-time perspective, um, obviously, we're looking at things like alarm clients um, and alarm clients that are able to filter information very simply um, down to uh, the right assets, perhaps the right tag uh, in context. And you can see we've got a, a new alarm client here with um, some uh, touch-friendly capabilities. Um, but it isn't just about uh, real-time alarm clients. You can see there we've got a KPI on the screen and it's got an alarm border around it. So it's not always the best case to have an alarm client on the screen, especially when you start to get scroll bars in there because um, it's very easy to miss some of the key alarms, especially if you start to get a flood in there. But if you can look at things like alarm borders as part of the process, it draws your attention as, into the right area as quickly as possible and you understand exactly uh, the, the reason why that is because we can see what part of the process is affected. There's also elements around alarm context. Um, so there's alarm context, which has been out for quite a few years now in terms of alarm halos, alarm acknowledgement. So on the right hand side there, you see some trend data um, and it automatically correlates the alarm information over the top of that trend data. So we can see um, how long an alarm um, was in the alarm state for when it went into an alarm who acknowledge the alarm, the reason behind it, any comments associated with it. This is all, again, functionality that is out of the box with system platforms. So you um, only have to store that data and have alarms configured for it to automatically present that for you. And then in some of our latest technologies, we have um, things like maps. So again, you, where I mentioned that um, alarm clients in terms of the alarm borders, we can very, very quickly see from a map, so this could be a very high-level overview, there's a problem in, in a certain site, or two sites in those cases, two out of five sites, 
um, have got alarms. Um, so we might need to then click in and drill in and see what the reason behind that is. Um, and there are also alarm functions to think about. So um, alarming very much used to be an alarm appears. Um, we have to deal with an alarm, so we may acknowledge it. It may return automatically and without it being acknowledged. There's lots of settings that you can um, now change because you may not want to miss an alarm that is returning to a, a normal state. So there's things you can do there, and you've been able to do that for a long time. Um, but over the past probably five years, they've introduced things like um, uh, alarm shelving, alarm suppression. So this allows us to, if, for example, we're taking a part of the factory offline, we're taking off um, a load of PLCs, we can um, suppress those alarms to make sure that we don't get those floods because there's a PLC offline. Um, if for any reason uh, a, an operator in real time has to shelve an alarm, uh, they can do so, but they have to supply a reason and a duration for that uh, alarm shelving period um, because that is, that is part of the, um, uh, the standards and the guidelines that exist. You have to, have to do that. Um, so again, it's just additional functions from alarm management. And then when we, we move into um, our historical display, this is obviously a bit more around what happened, um, what happened to our system. There's a complete audit trail that exists there. So any actions that have been performed by users um, uh, exist, any alarm acknowledgements, it's the user that, that is associated with that. Um, as part of those alarm functions as well, like I mentioned previously, if you require somebody with a high level sign off to also sign off an alarm before you can get back into production for whatever reason, um, you can set an alarm hierarchy like that so that um, it can't just be a general operator at the bottom layer that, that acknowledges an alarm. Um, just for whatever reason, this could be a more serious case uh, and it has to have some high level manager sign off associated with it. Um, and then from another historical perspective, it's really key to look at alarm analysis and alarm analysis is um, really important when we uh, uh, look at, again, if we're following standards like in your 191, um, we want to effectively reduce the number of alarms our operators are seeing. So alarm analysis won't resolve these problem alarms inside of your infrastructure. But what it will do is automatically identify um, which are the bad actors. So it'll look at things like the top 10 bad actors, and the minute you can start to knock some of those top ones off the list, you'll very quickly reduce the number of alarms your operators are seeing, and then they're more likely to get that one alarm every 10 minutes that they can then um, deal with much more effectively. Um, and then lastly, we're gonna have a, a quick look into centralization, um, and it's key for a number of reasons. There's obviously an architecture perspective, um, and in in terms of architecture, there's lots of flexibility we can have here. So in this case, we've just got some thick clients. Um, it's a, obviously a very uh, simple structure. It's a very, um, uh, just a, a couple of in-touch nodes or SCADAs or HMIs. Um, so there, there's some flexibility there where we can just be in a machine basis. Um, but it can obviously move up to something much more complex and um, virtualized. You might move to some types of fault tolerant hardware, you may use thin clients, and there's lots of reasons for this. Um, uh, one of the reasons is security, and there's lots of security benefits to be had out of moving to a centralized location, um, because if you're running centrally on servers, then you want to be having to think about patching a couple of servers rather than a load of um, thick clients that exist on the shop floor. We then move to thin clients on the shop floor here in, in this scenario. Um, it's also really key for things like upgrades, both in terms of software and security patches. So if you're looking to keep up to date on the latest software in terms of your SCADA solution, um, things like inline upgrades, if you have centralized servers, you can fail over everything so that one server can deal with um, the, uh, the, the running and the production of the plant while you upgrade the other server um, and then fail it all over and, and do the upgrade on the other one. Um, so there's some, some benefits to be had there from move, moving centrally. Um, from the security patches perspective, obviously this is all about keeping current um, to, to prevent threats, threat detection, things like that. Um, and again, centralization is key to ensuring uptime in that scenario too. Um, there's lots of things that can be um, benefited from having a centralized solution. 
Um, obviously, we have lots of webinars that, that detail that, but this is one of the key things in terms of architecture as to the fundamentals of, of what we think about when we're looking at SCADA and, and centrally managing our solutions. Um, and I'd just like to, to finish up with a bit about the ecosystem. Um, so here we have obviously ourselves and we deal with a lot of different types of customers. You guys, you guys that are listening to the webinar, um, our systems integrator community are obviously our, our route to market um, for our end users. And we, we tend to work best when we have a relationship with all three um, because we can help our end users, we can help our end users define um, what they might need um, through our systems integrators. We can help our systems integrators to um, define what the, the requirements are for their end users. Because um, obviously we provide direct channels in terms of support, in terms of pre-sales and directly to those channels. Um, we also have an ecosystem of partners. Um, so partners that can help us to achieve things that perhaps our software um, has, a, has, a, has a gap in. Um, things like, um, I suppose, predictive maintenance is a, is a good example of something where we, we would introduce a partner that can link in very closely with, uh, with our solutions. Um, if you've heard of things like Dream Report for um, our reporting package, yes, it's a Wonderware endorsed partner, but it is a partner, so they're also a partner of ours. And they're a partner that are very, very good at integrating seamlessly to the Wonderware product set, and that's the reason they're endorsed. But there are other partners out there that we work with to help us to achieve some some um, some of those those clever clever things out there. And our systems integrators are very very good at uh, engineering our solution, um, engineering some um, some fantastic things that I've seen over the years um, that enable our end users to work more efficiently um, and and effectively um, increase production. Um, and we also have our OEM community. So our OEMs. Um, especially um, these days we've seen much more uptake in terms of our web-based technologies because um, cloud is becoming quite a big thing for OEMs, being able to provide an additional service for their customers. It's no longer just about providing the machine uh, and delivering it, it's about providing um, some real-time or historical data analysis um, globally for their, their customer base. Um, so then just to summarize, and I thought I'd take us back to this organizational maturity, um, and I've put in um, some of the um, barriers, I suppose, or um, some of the um, things that, are, 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 that we struggle with at each of these um, levels in this maturity. So these are the things that I was discussing before, and we have throughout the webinar talks about these bottom layers here. Yes, like I mentioned, we do deliver on that enterprise layer and that adaptive um, standard for the enterprise type customers at the top level. But the things that we referred to um, throughout this webinar um, cover this, these elements. And we have products in the Wonderware um, stack that help us to address all those challenges that you just saw on that, that previous, previous slide. So I'd just like to thank you very much for your time um, and we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thank you.